uh, welcome. Um, one of my roles at Gordon and Reese is also that I chair our National Environmental and Toxic Tort Practice Group. Uh, and on behalf of the Gordon and Reese, as well as Forensic Analytical, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining our webinar. I, I always want to say seminar, and I wish it was a seminar. A seminar would be a lot more fun to see everybody in person. But webinar is what it is these days, and we'll do our best. It's actually, I think seminar is easier to do than a webinar. But again, welcome. And thank you for joining us. We're going to talk about going back to work and what's involved with going back to work. It's the health, safety, and legal concerns of going back to work. Uh, before I go any further, I want to just point out two quick little housekeeping matters. First of all, we're going to send copies of the PowerPoint presentation to everybody who signed up. We obviously have your email addresses. So we'll send you the PowerPoint presentation. And second of all, we invite, in fact, we encourage you to send us questions. Uh, use the WebEx format, and we're going to set aside, we're going to try to shoot for about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to have questions. So please, please feel free to shoot us questions. And if we don't get to them, because there's a good chance we won't have time to get to every one of them, we'll still respond. Uh, one of our presenters, uh, as appropriately, will respond to your questions. And speaking of presenters, let me introduce our co-presenters. Uh, first is John Martinelli. John's a principal scientist and healthcare director at Forensic Analytical Consulting Services. Like Gordon and Reese, Forensic Analytical covers the United States. They have offices in many states, and they have shared partners for those other states or locations in which they don't have primary offices. John's been in the field of environmental health science for more than 30 years. I've worked with John and his firm for many years. They're absolutely the best when it comes to evaluating situations like we're dealing with now. John's clients include hospitals, schools, insurance carriers, property owners, manufacturers, and many other types of, of entities. Um, I, I can say this from personal knowledge. Most recently, and I do not exaggerate, uh, those who know me know I'm, I can be uh, prone to exaggeration, but this isn't one of those times. John has been uh, working 24-7, servicing his clients and his firm's clients, advising them about the health and safety issues that have risen because of the COVID uh, crisis. Our next co-presenter is my law partner, Marie tremble Holbeck. Marie specializes in labor and employment issues, and she has kind of a sub-specialty uh, and has a group of clients that she consults with and litigates matters for that are restaurants in the resort uh, area. Uh, like John, Marie's been extremely busy the last several months helping clients work through, navigate through the maze of legal issues, particularly employment issues that have come up as a result of the COVID issues and crisis. Uh, I, I wanna add a footnote quickly about Marie. Like many of us, she's working at home and Marie is not only a super lawyer, but she's also a super mom because she's juggling both with a one and a half year old at home. And I know many people can empathize with that. The children at home and particularly in the grade school children or younger children, particularly difficult situation. Um, I, I also have to ask for a brief indulgence here because I'd like to vent just for one minute. And my vent has to do with a word that I really am tired of hearing. And, and I don't want to hear anymore uh, the word is uh, coronavirus. And can we just not use that word anymore? You know what I'd rather hear after the word corona rather than virus? What I'd rather hear, I'd rather hear corona beer. And you know what would be even a, a, another good word to hear after the, the word corona beer? How about if we could use a term like beach? Corona beers and beach, and this time of the year as we're getting into summer, the beginning of a three-day weekend, it would be excellent if we could just put aside the coronavirus concepts and issues and go back to things like corona beer and beaches. But as you know, unfortunately, we can't do that. And until we can fully appreciate the great things we had in our life, we have to deal with the realities that the coronavirus has brought us. And those realities include going back to work one of the very first steps. And so what we'd like to do today, and our goal is, is to go through those issues, the health and safety issues, the regulatory requirements, and legal concerns. 
Now, I know you're thinking legal concerns. You know, what's he talking about? We're involved with um, an unprecedented international health and economic crisis. And, you know, Peter Kowski, are you telling us that there are people that are more worried about lawsuits at this unprecedented time? And, you know, no surprise, and you all know this, the answer is yes. We're dealing with a lot of lawsuits. Um, and I wanted to touch base at the beginning of this to help kind of frame what the legal issues are. And then John's going to talk about the health and safety issues. And then Marie's going to come back and talk very specifically about the employment issues that involve your business, your insurance business, or your clients' businesses. But let me talk briefly about uh, the lawsuits, what I call the first wave of lawsuits that we've already seen. You know, we started dealing with this virus, this pandemic about three months ago. And in that time, there already been uh, quite a few lawsuits filed. The first type within this first wave really has to do with return of money, has to do with banking institutions and like institutions trying to recover on loans, and it also has to do with return of funds. So here's just some examples of that. I, I wanted to highlight one of my favorites was return of payments, specifically universities and tuition. As you know, majority, all the universities shut down before they were able to complete their academic year. I'm aware of three lawsuits filed uh, against universities, Boston University, University of Indiana, and the University of Southern California, where students and their families have brought lawsuits against those universities to try to recover at least some of the tuition. And, and as a parent of a University of Southern, a parent of a former University of Southern California student, I think it's an interesting concept. I wonder if I could go back and try to get some refund for maybe some of the things he didn't do when he was supposed to be uh, studying at school. But these, that's the first area, the first area of concern. As I mentioned, Marie's going to talk about the employment issues, but we've had a number of employment cases already filed. They have to do with wrongful termination, sick leave, statutory violations, and a host of other issues. Here's a, a short list, very short list of the kinds of uh, employers who have already been sued under these various theories and categories. Um, there's more lawsuits out there. We'll call it just kind of the miscellaneous types. For example, product pricing, marketing, marketing and labeling. An example of that would be somebody buys a disinfectant and they're claiming that the marketing or the label said you would kill 99% of the virus but yet I still got sick. That's one example. Shareholder and security litigation. That's when shareholders sue the corporation, more specifically the directors of the corporation, alleging that in this time of, of this crisis, this pandemic, that the corporation should have done something or not have done something to save the company or at least maintain the value of the company. We've also seen class actions. Probably the classic example of that is the passengers from the cruise ships. Rather than suing as individual plaintiffs, they grouped together and brought it as a class action. And there are certain benefits for doing that, and certain benefits for the lawyers who handle those cases. And then finally, I wanted to point out that there have been several lawsuits in the United States where United States citizens have sued the country of China. And the one I wanted to just share with you is there are various medical care providers, I believe it was in Florida, Southern Florida, who have sued China for what they allege was hoarding of personal protection equipment. So um, that's where we are, right? That's the lawsuit that we're already facing. But I'm going to suggest to you that in the near future, as you're watching late night television, cable network, for example, you're going to see a television advertisement that's going to start with the phrase, have you or a loved one been harmed by coronavirus? And my point is, we've got a lot more lawsuits coming. And I wanted just to kind of briefly go through the types of lawsuits we're going to start seeing, starting with the kinds of damages claims we're going to see. And some of the damage claims are going to be very straightforward, the kinds of damage claims we see in many other types of lawsuits property damages, loss of business, personal injury, wrongful death, 
There have already been some wrongful death cases filed. Uh, I'm not aware of personal injury cases yet, but I am aware of wrongful death cases. We're going to see claims for fear of COVID. Now, you may be scratching your head and say, well, what does that mean? Well, that's the, by way of illustration, that's the 75-year-old woman who shops, who's been shopping her once a week at a local grocery store and now finds out that the grocery store didn't comply with the CDC requirements. Now finds out that certain members of the grocery store staff became ill with the virus. And so she's going to claim, even though I don't have the virus, I have a heightened fear of the virus, a reasonable expectation that I may get the virus. Another item on the damage list is medical monitoring. Well, I don't have the virus yet, but because of some premise owner's alleged negligence, I'm at risk. So I need to be monitored. How about also the situation where I've already had the virus, but as we all know, we really don't know the long-term medical effects that the virus will have on people. So if there's a culpable party or at least alleged culpable party, one of the damage claims will be, you need to compensate me as I go through the next year, maybe even decade, to make sure, for example, my lung damage it, is, it doesn't get worse. And then some that we've already touched upon, loss of employment, statutory violations. The question then is, those are the damages. The question is, who's going to be sued? And I would submit the real question is, who won't be sued? I, I we fully expect, and I, I don't speak just for myself, this is what the lawyers are looking at, both from the plaintiffs and the defense side, we expect the floodgates to open and there'll be a lot of lawsuits. Now, there are a number of things that have to happen before that, that flood can happen of litigation, including the courts getting back up to full capacity. But when that happens, and it's a question of when and not if, we will see all kinds of lawsuits. And here's a list and some examples. Healthcare providers, basic example would be the nursing homes. Manufacture testing equipment and drug companies. Well, you, so, you, you came in and you gave me a test, a COVID test. You told me I wasn't sick, but in fact, your test was wrong and I was sick. One example. PPE manufacturers. Again, you might scratch your head and say, you mean they're going to sue the company that manufactured the mask? Well, there's precedent for that in other litigation. For example, in the asbestos litigation, mask manufacturers, even respiratory manufacturers, have been sued in hundreds, if not thousands, of cases under the theory that the mask was defective and allowed asbestos fibers to be in the hail. And I think the same theory will be used in, in COVID-related litigation. Another type of defendant will be indoor air quality professionals in the manufacturers of the HVAC equipment. Your equipment didn't work properly, and as a result of that, the virus was in the air. Maintenance and waste companies, insurance companies. Um, let me touch briefly upon that. There'll be claims that people are entitled to damages under a policy called business interruption. Here's a simple example. Let's say you owned a little restaurant, a little neighborhood restaurant, and somebody negligently drove their car, and I'm obviously being negligent, they drove your car into your restaurant. You had to shut down your restaurant, let's say, for a month as they did construction to get it back up to speed. And if you had an insurance policy that covered business interruption, you'd make a claim to that insurance carrier to, to be able to get funds back, insurance proceeds, to cover your loss of business. This is an extremely complicated area. We think it's the area that's already been very busy and it's going to get extremely busy. There'll be a lot of litigation over what those policies meant. And you have to remember an insurance policy is, is just in basic, simple terms, a contract. And so there's going to be a lot of squabbling and fighting back and forth about what the terms of that policy, what the terms of that contract really intended. And, and I'm not going to pretend to be an insurance coverage lawyer, I'm an environmental and toxic tort lawyer. But I can promise you that that litigation will occupy a lot of lawyers, a lot of insurance companies, and the courts for several, several years. Uh, premise owners. This, this is another area that I think is going to be, uh, there'll be a lot of litigation. Individuals or companies that owned apartments, that owned office buildings, 
that owned grocery stores, that owned department stores, that owned manufacturing facilities, any place in which people came to work or even visitors came. Um, and, then we, and then the next item listed is employers. You may say to yourself, Maria will talk a little bit more about this. Well, isn't my employee covered by workers' comp? In other words, the state or the statute has been set up so if you're injured at work, your compensation comes through the workers' compensation system, and the answer is yes. And under that same system, that employee, under a general rule, is not allowed to sue their employer in civil court, in, in a civil action. But there are exceptions to that rule. And we're already seeing some of them. And plus, we have a very creative and imaginative plaintiff's bar, and they will try to get around that. Let me give you two quick examples. In the past week, several employees of a McDonald's in Chicago have filed lawsuits, a lawsuit, against McDonald's. Now, not, they're not claiming injury as an employee. They're rather claiming that that particular McDonald's, and this is an allegation, created a public nuisance, a public health nuisance, because the McDonald's didn't properly protect the property as well as the people, including employees that came on site. That's one example. Another example, which is a twist, is what we call take-home exposures. So your employee is going to claim through some faults of the employer they got the virus. They got sick and infected at the work site. Then they went home and they infected their family members, maybe even a neighbor. And so it'll be the family members who will bring suit against the employer. And we call that take-home exposure. And again, to borrow from the asbestos litigation, we've seen those cases for decades in the asbestos litigation. A worker comes home and alleges that they brought home the asbestos dust and that dust was then transmitted to family members. And then I listed last year is specific individuals. If somebody has COVID and it acts unreasonable, is negligent and takes actions or doesn't take actions that exposes other people, could that be a defendant or could they be a defendant in a lawsuit? And then I think the answer is yes. But that's an area that the questions will become is how do you get compensation from that individual? So that'll play out over time. And this is just a partial list of people who I think and companies who I think will be sued. Um, so now I'm going to move on and I want to get our co-presenters involved. Um, John's going to talk about the health and safety issues, but let me end my short presentation by saying, how do you avoid the lawsuit? Well, it starts with listening to John and people like John. It starts with taking the necessary and appropriate health and safety steps to make your workplace as safe as possible. And I think if you do that, that will, won't eliminate, but it'll at least go a long ways to minimizing the legal concerns that you should have. John? Thank you, Mike. Well, with all that, I have to rethink whether I want to say anything because I might be one of those people with a target on my back. Um, and, and thank you for that setup, Mike. What we're going to go through in the next few minutes, and I see one of the questions that came up says, can you cover the point number four about EHMS and remediators? And, and I will throw that back to Mike in a bit. But as he said, the most important thing you do is be educated follow the guidance that's available, and uh, dot your I's and cross your T's. This is a, a unique situation that we find ourselves in, and people will be creative at trying to find ways to, to place blame. So what we're gonna look at is some health and safety requirements or guidelines that are put out there for employers or premise owners that, that are, there's plenty of those available, and some of what I go through will be um, probably already common knowledge to most, uh, because it is so becoming ubiquitous. Some practical steps to prepare the workplace. And remember, the goal here is to protect employees and visitors to your sites, whether it's vendors or customers or family members or, or a variety of people. So that's what we're attempting to accomplish here. And let's go to the next slide, please. So first, you need to make a plan. And I will point to something here in a moment that says, not only do you need to make a plan, it should be in writing. 
plan should include some prevention protocols. How do you prevent people from contracting the illness? What are the common safety measures for the people that are on site? What happens if after you've done all that, somebody on site still gets sick anyway? And a few other considerations for, um, uh, for, for discussion. Next slide, please. So first, I'm going to I'm going to point to something that California has put out. It's a joint venture between California Department of Public Health (CDPH) and Cal OSHA, and there's a California for All website. You can go to. There's a lot of different searches to get there, but if you just type California for All, it'll get you to that website. In there, there's guidance for a number of different types of of occupational settings, and or or business settings. And if you click on one of those and you find guidance, you'll find almost every single one of them says the same thing in the first paragraph. Establish a written worksite specific COVID-19 prevention plan at every office location. This one's obviously for offices. Perform a comprehensive risk assessment of all work areas and designate a person in each office workspace to implement the plan. So this is some pretty specific guidance. Now, in some locales, this is a guidance. It's a recommendation. If you want to do well, do this. In some jurisdictions, it's being mandated by the local public health department. So you'll need to know where you're at. Currently, California defines four stages. Stage four is the end of the stay at home order. Stage one is where we have been, stay at home, only essential businesses are open. We're moving in, in some lo localities, into stage two, where lower risk workplaces can start to open. With these guidance documents, they can start to open, but with significant expectations in place. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I will note that stage two, we are in stage two in many counties in Northern California, there are several counties in Southern California that have stated they will not be looking at stage two until mid-June or later. So what goes into your plan? First of all, what are you trying to accomplish? First and foremost, you're trying to protect people, all of the people, the people coming into work and the people that are coming in to um, visit the place of business. We want to protect our resources. And we want to protect our reputation. That's part of the, the very important thing. Not only do we want to protect people, the people that are coming in, whether it's staff or customers, you want them to have confidence that they can be there safely. You also need to plan for change because there is a changing community risk level based on the community. How many, how many cases have we seen? What is the, what is the impact on the local healthcare system? And what new information are we getting about the, the virus and the disease? So we start, as we continue to go through this, things are changing very rapidly, which is why I need to throw the disclaimer out there. Everything I'm talking about is based on the knowledge I have today. By the time we're done with this presentation, some of that could change. If you've looked at the CDC website, you'll find things like, don't wear masks because healthcare providers need the masks. And then a week later, Everybody should be covering their face with something. So things are changing dramatically and rapidly. And that is, again, by state, by county, and by city. Next slide, please. So what are you going to assess? Remember, there was an underlying statement there that says a risk-based plan, something that follows a risk assessment. So we need to know who are the people that are involved? Who are, who are they coming in? When are they coming in? Are they coming in in phases? Can we do alternate work, work schedules? What are they going to be doing when they get there? Will they be congregating in common areas? Will they be able to be isolated in an office where they can close a door? Will they spend time together for long periods of time performing co-tasks? And where will they perform those activities? We also need to look at the environment. We can look at floor plans and look at how the traffic may flow around the building or where our higher risk activities are going to occur. We need to look at the HVAC system. Is it adequate? Do we need to increase the outdoor air coming into the building? 
You may need to look at the plumbing systems. If the, if the building has been vacant for a period of time, is there a potential for the water to have been stagnant and biofilms to form and bacteria to grow? And we also want to look at indoor air quality. Has this base building been sitting stagnant for, for a while? Has, has mold and moisture started to be a problem? Or have, have things been left in people's cubicles that, that are now starting to like, ferment and decay? And you know, do we have food squirreled away in a refrigerator or in someone's desk? So we, what we're gonna look at what, where, how, and when do we clean and disinfect surfaces? We hear a lot of discussion about frequently touched surfaces. And we're also going to want to look at communications. How are we going to communicate to people? What kind of training are we going to do? Where are we going to put up signage? Are we going to use arrows and have one way in and a different way out? Things like that. Next slide, please. So we can organize the people by the groups, by the areas they work in, the operations they can do. We look at the hazards and come up with the safety measures that we need to put in place. Can we do distancing? Do we have adequate ventilation? Do we need to do masking when we're in common areas? And then we might got to communicate. We need to train all the employees and we also need to inform stakeholders. If we've got visitors coming on site, how do you notify the um, UPS or U U US mail or FedEx delivery person when they walk in the door where they need to go to drop the package so that they continue distancing? Do they need to be required to wear a mask? And how do you communicate that? Probably with signage, but that's part of the assessment process. And then you need to validate that your plan is being successful. So you audit the implementation. Remember back at that first slide, it says there needs to be somebody responsible for each part of the building where this plan is in place. If the plan is different for a cube farm than it is for the offices, somebody needs to be responsible to make sure that the plan's being followed for each of those locations. Document that the plan is working, adjust and improve the plan as you go along. Next slide. Certainly at this stage, there's still gonna be a, an expectation of physical distancing. Um, all of the guidance says continue to encourage people to work remotely, to work from home if, if they can. You may engineer physical barriers to prevent uh, exhale breath or cough from transferring from one location to another. And again, keeping distancing. Personal hygiene is very important. We're going to, we'll never get away from this. Frequent hand washing, frequent hand hygiene, reminding people of the importance not to touch their face before, uh, before cleaning their hands, and also frequent cleaning of items using the proper disinfectants. Protective equipment, are they gonna use face covers or masks or respirators? Each of those in the industrial hygiene community has a very specific <laughs> definition. Are they gonna use face shields for certain activities or at certain times? And then the environmental cleaning, identify those high touch, high touch surfaces. What about incoming items like delivery packages? Is somebody gonna wipe those down and then wash their hands after they wipe it down? Um, wipe wash hands before they touch it and after they touch it things like that need to be considered in addition to that um, you, you're going to want to consider the possibility that certain surfaces are touched so frequently that cleaning may not even be effective so in those locations you may have to station like a, a, a doorman somebody that opens the door for people coming in and out so you don't have to clean it every 30 minutes uh, some, of the, some of the other considerations are medical screening. And Mike already talked about that a little bit. This can be a bit of a challenge. How are you going to screen people? What activities are going to require screening? Um, is it gonna be a self-screening where they answer questions? If they answer questions, are you gonna have them fill out and sign a form? And what are the expectations? Is that a medical record? If we hunt through the CDC guidelines, we'll find that it is in fact a medical record and the employer needs to keep that record for the term of employment plus 30 years. You need to stay on top of what the current understanding of symptoms are. Are temperatures gonna be taken and if so, how? Is there gonna be some level of screening or, or um, medical testing that's part of your medical screening process? And then how are you going to communicate? What kind of training, what kind of signage, are you gonna use flyers? Are you gonna do overhead announcements? 
Uh, here's an example of a couple of signs. Um, there's a, a, a self-screening assessment poster that we've seen posted at a construction site where they come on and before people can come on site, they look at the sign and they, they answer all the questions. And if they don't have symptoms and they took their temperature before they left their house and said they were good, they can come on the site. Uh, the middle um, sign there, that comes right from the CDC, it's free. The other one, somebody did in Word, it took them just a few minutes. So there's a lot of, lot of things you can do to communicate. Next slide, please. I don't want to spend a lot of time going into the discussions about what's the difference between a face cover and a surgical mask or a respirator. Uh, I will say that, you know, you see some examples here. Face covers and surgical masks, by, by definition, are there to protect other people from the person that is wearing them. Respirators are there to protect the person wearing the respirator. Respirators require training. They need to be NIOSH approved. They require medical approval before you can wear them. They, they require annual fit testing. And some respirators, like the one on the right, has an exhalation valve that is not filtered. So that respirator would do a really good job of protecting the wearer if they're wearing it properly. But they can exhale unfiltered breath, and it may not protect the person around them. So when you're looking at masks, you need to understand what you're trying to accomplish with them and if there are some special requirements related to certain types. Next slide, please. So again, coming back to work on response mode. Now you're back to work and while you're there, somebody has symptoms. Now we need to do a deep dive. Who was impacted? Who did that person come in contact with? It's that contact tracing methodology. What was impacted? Where did they go and how did they impact it? And when were they there? How, and we look at the symptom morphology. Could they have been asymptomatic? And what's the typical si time for onset of symptoms? How far back do we have to look at the environment for when they could have contaminated? And then you have to have a communication plan. How are you gonna communicate to employees and customers that you have in fact had a known or suspected case on site? Who's going to be quarantined? You're gonna go into a certainly an enhanced environmental cleaning and disinfection level. And then you're going to probably increase those practices again for a period of time. And then again, confirm what you are doing through observation, documenting your observations and continuing to communicate to staff so that they can be both safe and confident that they are safe. Next slide, please. Some other considerations. You should probably have a COVID-19 team. You have a core team, the people that are responsible for the safety plan and its implementation. You also want some stakeholders, specifically somebody that has access to the money, so that if you do have to take additional steps, that you have the funding to do that in a rapid manner. You're going to want to keep up the speed on supporting on and, and, and get supporting resources. If you need to do a deep cleaning, is that something you're going to do in house? Or are you going to contract out for that? You wanna have that set up ahead of time. So as you go back, you wanna have your contingency plans already in place. So if you do have to respond to a case, you can respond immediately. You also wanna consider building shutdown and startup. How did the building get shut down? When we go to start it back up, do we need to look at the HVAC system? When we open this thing up, is there a possibility that it's gonna drop settled part particles all over the place? And you're gonna to wanna to do an environmental cleaning so people don't come in to a lot of bits and pieces over their desk. And again, the water systems, are we going to be concerned about Legionella? Do we need to do some flushing? And then a general walk through, through the space to make sure there's no surprises in there, that no, no varmints have taken up residence in your absence. Critical supply management. How are you going to get protective equipment and hand hygiene solutions and disinfectants? This is a difficult time to get these things. So you're going to want to have your, your team in place to both make sure that you are procuring that prior to occupancy, and then you have an ongoing procurement process. And then also vendor and visitor management. How are you gonna to communicate to them? And I mentioned that already a little bit before. That'll wrap it up for my part of the presentation. I'll pass it on now to Marie Trimble Olvek. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I get to talk about all of this the scary employment ramifications to bringing uh, folks back to work. 
and I know there's a lot of concern about this. As Mike mentioned, I've been very busy for the last two months uh, dealing with questions about, you know, first it was layoffs and furloughs, and now the questions are how do we bring people back? So that's where I want to start, which is, you know, welcome back. We're allowed to reopen in, in some sort of phased process. How do you decide who to bring back? Um, and this is really the first litigation trap because you have to have a fair method that you can defend in terms of how you bring employees back. So the easy one is seniority. If you want to bring back the more senior employees first, those who have worked for you for a long time, uh, that's a system that really is difficult to question in litigation. Um, however, what most employers typically want to do is bring back their best performers first and leave their poorer performers at home or not bring them back at all. Um, and so I've counseled clients that performance is certainly a reasonable um, metric to use, but you need to have good files. So if you have a good personnel file for employees that show, uh, you know, performance warnings uh, or outstanding evaluations, you know, something that you can point to, you can make, you know, reasonable, kind of well, well-reasoned decisions on performance, but you do need a record to support it. But the situation you don't want to be in is where you have a bunch of individual managers uh, bringing their favorite folks back, that's where you're going to walk yourself into litigation. They're, they're going to play favorites for a variety of reasons. Um, so I would encourage, you know, upper-level management, help come up with a plan of who you're bringing back and why. Put that plan in writing in case you have to defend it later, and then make sure that it's executed appropriately. Um, when I talk about litigation risk, um, you know, the, the first concern is age. Um, you don't want to bring back all your 25-year-olds and leave all of your 60-year-olds at home. Um, I know that there is a, a concern that, um, you know, older workers may be more susceptible to catching COVID, that maybe they're safer at home, um, but that's not your decision to make. If an employee feels that they can't come back to work because they're uh, at a higher risk level, that's a different issue. We're going to talk about some uh, disability uh, accommodations, but you cannot use age as one of the factors in deciding who to bring back. Um, disability, same situation. So if you try and bring somebody back, um, and they tell you that they can't come back for, for a particular disability-related reason, you can engage in the, the normal interactive process where you have a discussion of potential accommodations, it might be telecommuting, um, but you can't knowingly leave somebody at home because you think they have a disability that's going to put them at risk. Um, that needs to be a discussion with the employee. Uh, gender is another risk factor. This is why you want to have a clear selection process. Um, if you have, you know, a performance or seniority-based process, you're not going to open yourself up as, um, you know, as, as widely here to potential age or sorry, gender claims. I mean, the one that I didn't put here that I do want to touch on is race. Um, so the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is a federal agency that handles employment claims um, in, in short form EEOC. So you're going to hear me talk a fair amount about the EEOC. Um, the EEOC specifically issued guidance. Um, you know, indicating that they are still enforcing their non-discrimination policies and that you cannot discriminate against Asian American employees. Um, you've probably all seen in the news that there have been a, you know, after, um, you know, the original thought that this came from China and, and of course, we've, we've seen this evolve over time, you know, where did this really start, where were the earliest cases, but um, there was this fear that anybody from China might have uh, COVID-19. Um, and because of that fear, uh, restaurants in Chinatown, as Mike mentioned, I work with a lot of restaurants, and suddenly Chinatown, before there was even a shelter in place, uh, was seeing a decline in business, and this was in Chinatown across the country, uh, Asian American uh, workers and, and individuals being treated differently. And so, you know, one specific thing to keep in mind here is that you cannot discriminate against employees based on their race, and there, there is particular sensitivity right now um, to Asian American employees. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. So when you are ready to bring people back, um, the thought is, why would I need an employment offer? You know, in most cases, if you either lay somebody off or furloughed them, you kind of, you're still thinking of them as your employee. If they're furloughed, they still are your employee. Um, so why on earth would you want a written offer? Well, there's three important reasons why you want to put the return to work in writing. Um, the first one is if you have been lucky enough to get one of the uh, Paycheck uh, Protection Program loans, the PPP loan, um, the forgiveness rate for that loan is tied to how many employees you are able to bring back to work. Um, so, for example, if you had, I'm just making up numbers here, 50 employees before all of this happened and you bring, you know, 48 back, that's going to affect your forgiveness percentage on that loan. If you bring all 50 back, 
then the loan can be fully forgiven, at least for the payroll um, aspect of that loan. So let's say you offer, you know, all 50 people to come back to work and only 40 of them say yes. You can actually point to those written offer letters uh, in connection with your PPP loan to show that 10 people have declined the offer to return to work. And the fact that you're at 40 instead of 50 employees is then not going to be counted against, counted against you the same way. So being able to point to those written offer letters is really important. Um, the other issue is unemployment benefits. So if you've laid off workers or if you furloughed them down to, to either very few hours or zero hours, um, the, uh, the expectation is that employees are at home getting unemployment benefits. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later, but there is this big concern that employees are saying, you know, I would really rather stay home. I feel safe at home. Um, I don't want to come to work. Oh, and by the way, I'm making more money on unemployment than I am working for you, so I'm not coming back. Um, what you need to do is put a written offer showing the terms of the offer. If the offer is comparable to what they were making before, and they decline your offer, they cannot stay on unemployment. And, and each state has a slightly different definition um, of how you're eligible for unemployment. In California, um, the EDD is the, the entity that looks at, that, that governs benefits and is going to look at these letters. And their metric is, was the offer suitable? So if you gave a suitable offer of employment that was turned down, employees can't sit at home and continue collecting unemployment. Um, the idea is that we want people to come back to work if they're able to. Um, now, on the flip side, if they were making $15 an hour and, you know, you, you reduce it by a couple dollars, you change titles, you change job descriptions, it, it may be that it's not a, a quote-unquote suitable offer of employment and they can stay home, but, but it really depends on this employment offer. So you do want to put your offers in writing. Um, and then finally, you want to control expectations. So, um, you know, in the restaurant context, you might have, you know, people who have been the general managers or manager on duty. Um, and really doing true management tasks, and you just don't have that kind of work for them right now. Um, I have a lot of clients who have their managers working as cashiers because they just want to keep those managers employed and, and showing up to work right now, but they're really not doing manager duties. And so putting your expectations in writing, you know, something to the extent of for the next six months, we are going to have you working in the following position, the following salary, you know, make it clear if they're not really working as a manager anymore. Um, make it clear if you plan to bring them back to a manager position once work picks up. Um, I think, you know, John touched on this. Communication is really key. There's a lot of fear right now, um, and that goes to the employment context, too. There's fear about, am I going to have a job? How long am I going to have a job? And so the more you can communicate, the better. Um, the other question I've gotten on this point is, what about new hire paperwork? You know, once again, we don't really see these people as new hires because they're just returning employees, whether it's a, a furlough or a layoff. Um, there are a few things you want to make sure you have updated in the employee files. So the first one is particularly important for somebody who has been laid off. If they've been laid off, they were not your employee for some period of time. And when you bring them back, you do have to recomplete the I-9 paperwork. Um, you have to have a, a current uh, I-9 in the file. Um, the other key things relate to sexual harassment policies, arbitration agreements, and anything related to wage and hours. So meal period waivers, um, you know, acknowledgement of a handbook, that they're really key policies that are important to, you know, running your business, but also come up a lot in litigation. So, you know, I'm not saying that you need to redo, you know, the full 100 pages of your normal new hire packet, um, but, but the really key provisions, I would, you know, onboard employees with some kind of you know, shortened form of a, of a new hire packet. Um, and then I, I touched on this a little bit already, but, you know, the thank you but no thank you, can an employee uh, refuse to return to work? The answer is yes. There, there are some situations where an employee can refuse to turn, return to work. Um, and this ties in very much with what John was just talking about. So if an employee does not feel safe coming back to work, or, or if you have not taken steps to make sure that the workplace is actually safe, they can say that this is not a safe work environment and they can refuse to come back. Um, that ties back to whether it's a suitable offer. Are you, are you bringing them back to a safe workplace? Um, so it really is important to communicate um, what you're doing, you know, cleaning methods. We're, we're cleaning high-touch surfaces. Um, let employees know what kind of screening is going to be involved, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Uh, let employees know uh, their, their rights to telecommuting, if you're going to offer telecommuting. Um, and so an employee can say they're not going to come back, but they can only do so in appropriate circumstances. 
Um, I'll talk more about disability as well, but disability is another circumstance where an employee can say, look, I'm not able to return to work, and you do have to engage in an interactive process with them. I'll uh, move on to the next slide here. Um, so are you feeling sick? Me medical screening. This might be the most common question I'm getting right, right now, which is, can I screen employees? How do I screen them? Um, this is a little bit different than what John was talking about and really coming at this from the employment uh, angle and what's legal and not legal. Um, so the, the first thing to keep in mind is, in the normal circumstances, any employment attorney would tell you, don't ask somebody about their medical condition. Don't ask them about their disability. You're not entitled to that information. Um, the EEOC, back when H1N1 um, was all on our radar, which has been some time now, issued what they called their pandemic guidance. And so I would encourage everyone to only take, you know, five or ten minutes, go to the EEOC website um, and read the pandemic guidance. It's essentially one to two pages of kind of a Q&A. What it does, though, is it outlines what you're allowed to ask and how you're allowed to ask it. The, the answer is that in a pandemic, some different rules apply. And so you are allowed to ask specifically about symptoms. Um, I know that the, the list of symptoms keep growing, and so um, the EEOC refers to the CDC website, so I've actually been regularly checking the CDC website as well. Um, you know, at this point, you could have a checklist about fever, cough, shortness of breath, you know, tightness in the chest. There's, it, I would say check the CDC and, and continue to check it because the list of symptoms keep growing. Um, but you can have a form asking specifically whether an employee has been suffering from any of these symptoms. Um, for temperature checks, there are a couple of approaches. You can ask an employee to um, take their own temperature at home and report to you if it is over, you know, the, the normal range, you know, over 100 degrees, um, or you can have it done at work. But if you do these questionnaires or temperature checks, um, you do have a, a duty to maintain the information in a confidential manner and to obtain it in a confidential manner. So just an example, um, let's say kind of more of a factory setting, that you've got you know, 25 employees who are all supposed to show up at 6 a.m. every morning. Um, if you're going to make them fill out a form and have their temperature taken, that's going to take some time. So you now have 25 people waiting in line, um, and let's say that whole process maybe takes 10 minutes. You have to pay them for that time. This is a work-related requirement. Um, so then you have to figure out, do you have them clock in first, knowing that somebody who is sick might be touching a, a clock in, clock out system, um, or do you just add the 10 minutes, or do you adjust their time clock later? Um, regardless of the form you take, you have to make sure that employees are, are spent, or excuse me, are paid for the time that they spent standing in line. Um, there is very similar case law on this point. Um, where this has come up in other circumstances is, you know, factories or other large workplaces um, that do screenings of bags uh, before or while employees are leaving to make sure that they're not bringing weapons or taking out anything, you know, uh, trying to avoid theft. Uh, courts have held that in those circumstances, you have to be paid for waiting in line. And then kind of similarly, if you've got to put on any specific gear for your job, it's called donning and doffing. If you're, if you're putting on and taking off, uh, equipment you have to be paid. So, so this is very much the same as that. If you're waiting in line for an employer requirement, you need to be paid for it. You also need to make sure that this information is being collected in the confidential manner. So whoever is doing this questioning, um, you know, taking the temperature, collecting the form, doing the verbal questioning, they need to do that in a private space. So you, you shouldn't have somebody get to the front of the line and be questioned in front of all of their coworkers. You should have a a private space where uh, the person who's doing the questioning, the temperature taking, um, can, can perform this task, they can record it in a confidential manner, and then this information needs to be stored in medical files or separate files. Um, it should not be stored in personnel files. Um, so that goes to both record keeping and privacy concerns. Um, if you do have somebody who's sick, uh, you know, part of the importance of having them in this own you know, kind of separate room is that you can also discreetly send them home. It's not as though all of their coworkers are around um, watching them be told to leave. So you do want to keep this, this private. Um, and then I've addressed the wage and hour concerns. The, the concern there is that if you are going to do this process um, of questioning the temperature taking, you do have to pay them uh, for the time that it takes. Now, that goes to one idea that John mentioned, which is staggering start time. So, you know, in order to um, minimize your, your exposure on wage and hour claims, try to do things to avoid having somebody wait in line for 10 minutes. Um, perhaps you have five people show up at 6 a.m. 
you know, five, five people show up at 6.15 and five people show up at 6.30. Um, there are ways to, to manage and stagger um, start times that have people in line for a shorter amount of time and really address this concern. Also, privacy, you have fewer people around. Um, then with respect to training, there's so many different angles that we can go with training. Um, you need to make sure that the person who is collecting this information is trained to know what they can and cannot ask. Um, the EEOC has some very specific questions I would directly copy and paste from their website. They are spot on. It's uh, great federal guidance of what you can and can't ask. Provide that training to the person who is uh, collecting this information. Um, and then the other form of training is training your employees on what you can and can't do um, in the workplace. And, and I'll talk about that in the discipline section. Um, and then finally, employee safety during screening. Um, similar to what we're seeing if you're waiting in line at you know, Costco or the grocery store, you know, six feet apart, uh, people are waiting in line for screening and the person who's conducting the screening um, must be provided with appropriate um, protective gear, so masks or a face shield, um, depending on what type of screening you're doing, it may even be a gown. Um, so you do need to provide the, the appropriate protective equipment for the person who's conducting the screening. Why don't we move on to the next slide here. Employee accommodations. This is a, I know I'm covering a lot of kind of big broad topics here quickly and I am happy to take follow-up questions. Um, but, but this is another area where I've gotten a lot of questions. So I'm sure we all followed it. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This was the, uh, the original act, if you will, uh, that was the response to, you know, how do we help Americans who are getting sick, who can't come to work, who are having childcare issues. Um, so you know, employees do have a right, um, depending on the size of your business, if you're under 500 employees, to get additional paid sick leave than they might otherwise be entitled to. Um, if they come down with COVID-19 or if they need to care for a family member who has come down with COVID-19, or if they are having symptoms and they suspect that, that they have it, they need to go get tested. So there, there's a number of criteria where the paid sick leave applies. Um, the extended FMLA applies in the situation of the, the employee who um, can't come to work because of childcare applications related to uh, daycare and school closures related to COVID-19. So if an employee expresses concern to you about not feeling well or having a family obligation, um, the first, you know, gut reaction um, should not be to just say, okay, well, you know, go home. You need and have a legal obligation to provide them guidance on their rights under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and then I say the state and local paid sick leave laws because, you know, what happened, uh, at least in California, is that the Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, dealt with employers with less than 500 employees. And so uh, many state, state and then local governments said, well, that doesn't seem right. You know, we want our larger employers to have to comply with this too. And so there are different state and local ordinances that also provide additional paid sick leave. And so you do need to make sure that you know your state and local law. Um, telecommuting is going to be a reasonable accommodation for a very long time. So um, before this, I had a lot of clients say, well, we can't have this person do their job from home. It's just not as effective. We need them to come in. You know, we need face time with our team. Um, we're living in a different world now, and, and the EEOC has made it very clear that telecommuting will be a reasonable accommodation if, if, if it is truly a job that can be done from home. So you know, telecommuting is clearly not going to be uh, the appropriate outcome for a restaurant cashier. It is going to be the appropriate outcome for, you know, an attorney. Um, and I know we're running short on time here, so I'll just quickly cover uh, you know, flexible hours are kind of similar to telecommuting. Um, if you have employees who tell you, you know, we have childcare responsibilities, I, I can do my work from you know, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and again for two hours at nap time and then another you know, three or four hours in the evening, the answer right now is yes. And the guidance will be clear that you do have to provide that flexibility. Um, I, I think the key takeaway here is that this is a constantly changing landscape. Um, we don't know all the answers. We're making predictions based on what we've seen, you know, in, in either other pandemics or, or other, um, you know, other cases that, that I think provide similar guidance, but uh, the answers will keep changing, and so you have to stay on top of it. Okay, and then let's finish up on my one last point here, employee discipline. Um, it, the short answer is you can discipline employees if they don't follow the rules you put in place. If masks are required in your state or, or as an employer, you indicate that somebody has to wear a mask and that's gonna be a rule uh, and somebody refuses to do that, you can send them home. You can write them up, you can terminate them. 
Um, if somebody comes to work sick, you can send them home. Um, again, you have to guide, give them guidance on take the paper requirements, but send them home. Um, ignoring other rules such as personal space or you know, closed spaces such as you know, kitchens or other areas are all appropriate grounds for employee discipline. Um, so I, I will leave it at that because I can see some questions coming in. And Marie, this is Mike again. Thank you so much for that. Let's jump ahead because, uh, and we'll stay on as long as we can. Um, I'm not gonna review the takeaways because I do wanna get to the questions. So let, let, me, let me throw the first question out to John and Marie. I'll give John you the first chance. So w what about the mask? I mean, does an employee have to provide it him, him or herself? Uh, what if the mask that the employer wants is different than the mask the employee wants to wear? Um, you know, give us your thoughts about that, and then Marie, why don't you join in after that? Sure. John, I think you're still on mute. Sorry about that. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Great question. Really appreciate that one. Masks are a little bit tricky. Um, we've moved into a territory where it's always been the case where if your safety plan or the job or or regulations that are in place require personal protective equipment, the employer has to provide it, and it has to provide a choice of equipment that is suitable to the employee to provide them the, the protection that they need. We're presuming that that's still the case. If the employer's safety plan requires them to wear face coverings, uh, you know, some sort of, of level one surgical mask or cloth masks that have, you know, wrap around your ears or bandanas or whatever it is, that the employer has to provide it. Um, and it is a little bit tricky because you, it's very difficult to evaluate the, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with it. We know with respirators, you can do fit testing to see if they're actually protecting the employee. Um, we can't really do that with face coverings that are designed to protect the people around the wearer. So you pretty much are stuck with, does it look like it does what we want it to do? So that's, that's I think, the approach that would need to be taken. I'm going to defer to Marie on, on what is really going to be required by statute. Yeah, so, so I see this as similar to, you know, any other sort of uniform question. If there is something that the employer is required to wear, um, the employer needs to provide it. Um, now, it, again, similar to uniform, does that mean we give you a new mask every day? Does that mean we give you one mask and we tell you to wash it, or two masks and we tell you to wash it? Um, I think there's some wiggle room there, but at the end of the day, if the employer is saying, you know, you must wear this particular um, mask, the employer does need to pay for it and provide it. Thanks, Maria. I, I do want to follow up with that. There's a lot of guidance out put out by CDC and others that will give you procedures for how to don a mask, how to doff a mask, and how to when to replace it, when to launder it. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's really a good idea to go find those documents that are available on, on the CDC website for free. Uh, probably better to adopt that. At the end of the day, you're trying to solve a problem. You're trying to protect people, and you need the people to do it and be, be confident doing it. John, a different question. So you have no reason to believe your HVAC system is inadequate. It's always worked properly. You've never had any problems or complaints. No one's gotten sick. There are no claims. But does the COVID situation require that I, I improve my HVAC system. Do I have to have something different just because we now have COVID as a new concern? Another, another excellent question. And I'm gonna give a, a good consultant's answer. It, it really depends, right? <laughs> and I know how frustrating that is because frankly, I would much rather point to something and say, that's where it tells you yes, or that's where it tells you no. But this is really risk-based. I can tell you most of the guidance related to HVAC says to increase ventilation, right? Now this is intriguing because if your system is balanced really well and you've got good air mixing and, and a lot of complicated theory is involved in this, but if you come back half staff 
one could make an argument that you've got twice as much fresh air as you would if you had full staff. But a couple of the other regulations that are, are, are recommendations are increase to 100% outside air, close off the recirculating dampers, um, increase the filtration to MERV 13 or better. Other things that you might want to look at doing are putting local fans to direct exhausted breath away from other people and towards the exhaust fans in the HVAC system. Or maybe even use portable HEPA filtered units to quickly scrub and clean the air in the space that's occupied. Again, it really depends. If you've got a small, a small setting where you've got five offices with doors on it and you've got adequate ventilation to manage the CO2 in those offices, you're probably fine. It's a completely different scenario if you have common areas and you have to use conference rooms and things like that. But back to the back to the current recommendations, and it is a very complicated scenario. You need to distance people, you need to clean surfaces, and the guidance is increase ventilation, go to 100% outside air if you can, and uh, increase filtration on your recirculating systems if, if it's feasible, if your system can, can survive that. Good. Marie, here's a question about uh, temporary or part-time employees. And I'm going to ask it just generally, but, but are the rules and the issues you raised, do they apply any differently to that part-time employee versus your full-time employee? Sure. So, um, so I think I, I saw this question come through as well. So I think this is probably a, a difficult situation for uh, staffing agencies where where you employ, the, you employ the person, but you're sending them to a third party. You're sending them to a factory um, that, you know, you're relying on them to follow policy. So I think as the staffing agency, your duty is to reach out to your clients, those, those job sites, if you will, um, and request their, uh, their plan so that you understand what they're going to do. Are they going to be uh, requiring masks? Are they going to be, um, uh, you know, doing temperature screenings and, and other screenings? And then push back. I know they're your client, but push back if you think that they don't have the appropriate plan. There are polite ways to do that. You can uh, provide them with your own plan, but, but you do have an obligation as the employer, regardless of where you're sending the employee, uh, to ensure that you're sending them to a safe job site. Okay. And, and I believe there was an earlier question about what type of lawsuit or claim would be brought against an environmental health safety professional or, and or a remediation company. I want to just answer that or touch upon that quickly. Uh, there is some precedent we've seen in, in the context of mold and asbestos and other like exposures. We've seen lawsuits against both the remediation contractor and the environmental health safety experts. They come in the form of a negligence claim. The professional either failed to provide appropriate guidelines or instructions about the process, or if they were the contractor, they were negligent in terms of how they addressed the problem. You know, in an asbestos context, it would be removing the asbestos. In a mold context, it might be uh, removing the mold as, as well as sanitizing the area, stereotyping the area. So I, I think that would be similar in this context. The claim would be that the cleaning company, the remediation company, didn't do their job pro properly, and they didn't sanitize or sterilize the work area. And then the, the professional, the environmental health safety professional, was, the claim could be your guidelines weren't sufficient. They didn't protect our employees. Now, the standard of care there is what's reasonable, and you know, we, can, we can hypothesize of what's reasonable based on what we're seeing now, but that's, I'm sure, going to change over time. I, I have a, a question for Marie, and I'm going to make it the last question because we are past our time. And first of all, we appreciate everybody for joining us. But Marie, at 10 o'clock Pacific time on June 18th, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> Presenting a similar topic on your folks are back. What problems are you facing now? Because I guarantee there will be problems. <laughs> And John will join us as well. The three of us will be back on June 18th. When we put this together, we realized, and John highlighted and Marie highlighted, and I'll end with this point, this is a moving target. It's also flexible. And, and so we, we feel the need, and, and we're sure we're going to come back with 
some footnotes, additions, supplements, maybe even a few contradictions that we're going to learn between now and a month from now. And then also what we expect to happen is people are going to be, some people are going to be back to work, and there are going to be issues that despite brilliant professionals like Marie and John, we still haven't been able to think ahead. We haven't been able to forecast all the problems. So we're going to address those on June 18th. We invite you and hope you can join us for that. Uh, for now, though, thank you again and enjoy the holiday weekend. And thanks to my co-presenters. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody.